I knew nothing. I didn't have a social media presence. I didn't have a Facebook page, didn't have YouTube, didn't have anything. And I just jumped in. Then I just had to adopt to who I am, right? I'm not technical. Right. I'm not going to edit videos. How much did you generate in ad revenue? Uh, over $80,000 just from AdSense. What are maybe some of the habits or the traits that you think are essential to create what you have done? And that is a, a YouTube channel. Should I start a YouTube show or a video podcast or something like that? What advice would you have? What if I told you that it's possible to build a highly successful YouTube channel earning $80,000 a year just from ad revenue, lots more from multiple income streams, growing tens of thousands of subscribers and not editing any of your videos. Well, in today's episode of the Think Media Podcast, I'm excited to talk with Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time. He's a real estate investor, best-selling author, um, background as an economist, that's his education, and is gonna be dropping a lot of wisdom in a lot of areas in this episode. But as a YouTube creator, he has really built one of the un most unique models that I've ever seen on YouTube that I know that you'll be able to learn from for your own content, especially if you're looking for different ways of creating content easily, quickly, and simply. And so, uh, Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. And so for people just meeting you, um, who are you in a nutshell as far as kind of, you know, your career and what you're doing today? I would say I'm a former tech worker, right, who grew up in the Silicon Valley. I was investing in the stock market pre-internet bubble. Right, did quite well, turned seven grand into almost 200, only to lose 80% of it, right, which is quite painful. Some yeah. folks today may you know, feel similarly with crypto or other things. From that, I uh, went on to start a, buying real estate as the way to have a better financial future. Did that for 20 years, ultimately left the corporate job at 45 and have been retired for over five years. So that's, what, that's who I am. And so then you launched a YouTube channel and really a brand, when did One Rental at a Time start? One Rental at a Time started about two weeks after I retired because I was getting depressed. As a as somebody who was type A, go-getter, had a quota for 20 years, I could only operate moving forward. Right? Yeah. I, I didn't do still well. Yeah. Uh, so I was actually at my kitchen table regretting the idea of accepting a job offer because I'm very good at what I do and people were headhunting me and, and offering significant packages. And I just sat there at 45 at my kitchen table going, I may have to take a job on Monday. Not because I needed it, but because my ego mm -hmm. wouldn't let me. And I just remember sitting there going, you're an idiot. You know, you should take this as an opportunity to try to share your story. That's where one rental at a time, just the name popped in my head because that's what we did for 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, I said, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to give this a shot for 30 to 60 days and see what happens. And I knew nothing. I didn't have a social media presence outside of LinkedIn, right? Which was what you used for business. I didn't have a Facebook page, didn't have, you didn't have YouTube, didn't have anything. And I just jumped in and I found Think Media and things like that that said, that made me feel comfortable because I could understand it. Then I just had to adopt to who I am, right? I'm not technical, right? I'm not going to edit videos. So that went out the window, right? I, um, I didn't have space. I wasn't going to, I was willing to spend a little bit of money. But I wasn't going to, you know, go buy thousands of dollars of equipment. So my phone was was my camera for a long time. Uh, I recorded out of my kid's bedroom for a long time. And yeah, so it, it was a lot of fun. But that's 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 my story with YouTube. And so it started what year? I believe 18. OK, so you started one rental at a time. And that was your model, meaning one rental at a time you invested money you set aside from your salary Correct. into one rental at a time. Exactly. And then and then once things started to compound, you could cash out refi exactly. or re refinance and all that stuff. So you kind of started with that vision. One of the things you're known for today, one of my favorite shows on YouTube is Daily Financial News. Has that been going the entire time? Uh, I wasn't called that in the beginning, but yeah, I would say it's always been about five days a week in the beginning when I didn't really have a, I didn't really figure out YouTube, my version of it for the first year. I was trying lots of different mm. things, right? If you went to my channel, looked at my playlist, I tried lots of different things to feel what, what it felt like to me. Uh, the daily financial news really was probably one of the first thing that hit because I didn't change anything other than taking notes. For 20 years, I wake up ungodly early without an alarm clock, and I read for 60 to 90 minutes. So I've been doing that for 20 years. I haven't changed a thing other than I take notes and I maybe cite sources just so people can go find the articles. So that 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 was the first thing that really felt good to me. 
was the daily financial news. There's a lot of nuggets in there. I think one, you you took, that's such a picture of turning your passion into profit, taking what you already do, what you're already curious about, what already fascinates you, what's already that you're not like, it's not a tactic. Like, oh, this would do well on YouTube. You've been living, consuming data that for someone like me does not consume and does and wants synthesized. And so you then turn that into a show, what you already read, what you already research. And then you also mentioned a powerful nugget in there that it took you about a year to figure things out. So for, I know a lot of people looking, thinking about starting, like they just want this thing to happen after one week, after one month, or they want clarity all at once. Do you think that's the wrong approach? Yeah. I think if you're going to take a shot at YouTube, there's a couple of things you have to think about, you know, one is, is the goal, the ad revenue, is it money or is it impact? And for me, it's always been impact. The money has been amazing. And frankly, I had no idea it'd be what it is already. And it's growing, you know, monthly. Yeah. But impact was my thing, right? I, I came to this situation already financially secure and YouTube's an amazing place. I could, I, I touch people every day, thousands of people every day. I now get somewhere between 20 and 30 messages a day thanking me. Mm. And it, it just keeps you going. I never want to stop. Um, I actually, it's funny. I did every day for almost three years. It got to the point where I was like, I need to, I need to back off. So I start taking Fridays and Saturdays off, which I'm not always good at, Yeah. but I do take them off occasionally. But yeah, it's, it's about, I give it three hours a day, five days a week. Yeah. So it's, it just feels good. It, it really does. That's powerful. And what you just shared there, three hours a day, five days a week is what sustains all of the content that you're creating. Mm -hmm. And so you've uploaded 10 thousand videos. Yes. It's a really shocking number. And it's cool to be having you on the Think Media podcast at this moment, because that's a significant milestone. You recently hit it. It's, yes. Uh, YouTube just rounds it at this point. So, I mean, every I, I, video got, a, I got a note, uh, I think it was six weeks ago. It might've been seven weeks ago that my 10,000th video was loaded. Yeah. It's pretty wild. And so what is the system? Because for someone listening, they heard the headline of the opening, no editing, mm -hmm. but what is basically now your system and workflow for publishing content. Yeah, so it's really easy. So really I do two things on one rental at a time. You've already brought up the Daily Financial Show. That is Mike Zuber, right? Mike Zuber's commitment to delivering that. But really what makes one rental- And what's that show? Daily Financial News. So what's the framework of it? So so for- I hit the record, I hit the go live button. They're all live unless I'm traveling in the world and okay. internet is bad. I go live at 7.30 a.m. on the dot. Worst case, I'm a minute late, which very rarely happens, but it's, it's that scheduled. So you can count on me being live at 7.30 Pacific, Sunday through Thursday. It goes for 12 to 18 minutes based on the topics and I'm done. Yeah. That's it. And to be even a little bit more detailed, sure. now you have- like a little studio mm -hmm, and do. a whiteboard. Mm -hmm, correct. And you've got a couple things going on. So it's turned into a show. Uh, absolutely. And again, right, it, this is the evolution, right? In the beginning, it was me just talking to my phone. Then it was my computer. And then thanks to Think Media and what you've shared, I got a camera that you recommended. So thank you. It's amazing. But yeah, it's, it's just grown up. I took ad revenue and invested back in the business, right? I didn't, I had the money to go buy the toys, but that wasn't it. It wasn't about the toys. It was, it was about getting better at my craft and it just takes repetition. So now it, it so went from my kid's bedroom um, to a studio that's about a mile down the road. And it actually has three different rooms in it, right? I carved it up. So my daily financial news is in the middle. It's all soundproof. There's a whiteboard and it's five topics. And again, that's because of you, right? I used to come in, I used to say, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's just, I would waste time, the hook, right? To yeah. use your language. Uh, so again, you always have to be finding other mentors and, and help getting better at your craft. Now it's five things. Occasionally there's a sixth thing that's kind of some random thing, but it's pretty much the same format every day. So the pillar then, and you mentioned that's kind of your personal brand. It's your show. That's my You've show, decided yeah. it to be seven days a week. Um, and that's like the consistent foundation. And for those listening, you mentioned if you can't go live or if you're on the road, you recently took like a very dynamic international yeah, travel tour mm -hmm. on a cruise I, yep. with incredibly slow Wi-Fi, but you stayed consistent. I how'd you to. how'd you do that? So I would record uh, the evening before and Wi-Fi on, on a ship is not great. So you have I loaded it at the evening. I was able to get it live at 7.30 every day except one, which I think it went at 9.30 that one day just because it was so slow. Uh, but no, it's important for me at least not to miss. And if I was going to miss, I would tell the audience why. Mm -hmm. right? Com community tab no, or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. There'd be no surprise. And you were just using your smartphone and you plug in some kind of microphone? I did, yes. Yeah. Do you know what microphone you use? I don't. I can. It's like a little, is it wireless? No, that one has a wire on it. I tried a wireless one. I didn't like it. Got it. So it's just a little lightning port mm -hmm. microphone. Correct. 
and and you were able to keep the show going, obviously without the whiteboard. Correct. But you made a promise. And I think that, you know, before we go into the other half of the show, what is the importance in your opinion that you've experienced in terms of just the compound effect of being consistent and making a promise and actually showing up and fulfilling on your word? Well, it's just, it's just, you, it's so rare today. Mm. Right. There's a lot of people going after different messages, but they're not consistent. And also one of the things that you'll see on my channel, why I have 10,000 videos, I don't delete anything. Mm. Right. And I make a lot of calls and some of them are wonderful and some of them are horrible. So I like it that people can hold me accountable uh, and go back and watch them. I just did a whole run of, uh, you know, revisiting some of the earlier videos that don't have a lot of views. So um, people can go back and watch and I, I have receipts. So, yeah, that's uh, a lot of fun. That's cool. Okay. So, so that's seven days a week right there. That's seven uploads in mm -hmm. a seven day period. Mm -hmm. So then what's the other part of how you reach 10,000 uploads? So I think the key, or at least it's my opinion, what makes one rental at a time unique is it's not Mike Zuber. Other than the daily financial news, which I feel is my baby, maybe now it's my you know child, it's, it's past the baby phase. I have uh, eight to 10 different uh, returning guests a week. And we spend 50 to 60 minutes and we take three topics. And then those get scheduled out over the rest of the time. So again, one rental at a time is a collection of millionaires who got there with real estate. And that's very unique. It's it's not Mike Zuber, right? Yeah. I'm building a website now that really highlights the millionaires and people who are part of the community because it is all of us. It's different stories. Real estate, you can do lots of different things, houses, commercial, other things. So I want to provide a platform as long as you we click and we're not scammy and no down and leverage this and all that bring them into the family and, and, you know, help a lot of people. So people can visualize this. And I've been a guest a few times. The reason it's no editing is you bring a guest on zoom mm -hmm. and you figure out the three topics right within the first 60 seconds. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a minute or two. So you're like, what do you think about this? And so I, this is me on the show. You're like, I was thinking we talk about this and then, and you're like thumbs up or thumbs down. I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's, that sounds good. And I, and even for me, I start like jotting like a note or two, or maybe a framework I have off to the side. I was thinking about, we'd hit this, we'd hit this, and maybe we'll hit this if we have the time. Exactly. And then you're like, here we go. And you press record on Zoom. I do. Which from my perspective, with no critique whatsoever, but even that, I would much rather use StreamYard, okay. for example. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you change. I'm inspired that you even don't <laughs> because I, simply from the fact of it just proves, I mean, again, 80K a month growing, multiple six figures from other income streams. We'll touch on that. But you've got the book, you've got all the other stuff. But like creativity works best in constraints. Like simplicity is power. So it's literally just Zoom, which mm -hmm. I'm trying to suffocate the excuses of everybody listening to this because everybody's used Zoom. A hundred percent of people, not everyone's used other things, but like, do, because we all went through the pandemic, 100% of people have yeah, been on zoom. To me, zoom is amazing. And I don't know Streamyard. I've never used exactly. it. Exactly. So right? I'm not actually suggesting you change. I'm nope. just saying that like from my vantage point, I'm like, I'm personally offended actually <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that you, but also excited on the side because it just proves that really it's not the production value. No. And, and especially in this niche, which is educational, it really is the content value. There's People are not critiquing that. They're there for the conversations, the mm -hmm. topics you bring out, the millionaire guests. So you get the guest on Zoom. You literally just press record, have the conversation and turn it off. Correct. That is the upload. This is the whole process. We get on for 60 seconds, three topics. Yeah. One, two, three. There are 12 to 15 minutes. Yeah, I hit start, stop each time. So there's three different files. Yes. And then those download on my computer and then I upload them to, to YouTube. YouTube. Yep. And then it. they can be schedule uploaded. And I schedule upload, yes. Who does the titles and thumbnails? I do the titles. I now pay someone to do the thumbnails because I'm I got Where, graphics. Where'd you find them? Uh in my network in Fresno. So it's like a, a local domestic local, person. Yeah. Actually, they're now in Mexico, but they were local. They moved so out. how do you, once they're uploaded, do you say, hey, you know. I'm very consistent. So they know they're all uploaded by. So they just do them on autopilot. Correct. So so the system is created that the files are there and they, they know to pull the guests or they know because they've been working with you for mm -hmm. a while too. Correct. Because a lot of times it's a picture of like you and the guest mm -hmm. with some other kind of graphic or whatever. And then they have somewhat like of a template for daily financial news. Correct. So the, so the thumbnails are rocking. You do the titles. Correct. And VidIQ helps me, makes suggestions. Oh, yeah. VidIQ AI title generator. Correct. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, uh, at least get Again, you. Again, it's very easy for me, right? I put in what I think and then it cleans it up. I use it 90% of the time. Sometimes it just doesn't feel right. And then shorts, 
did I know we talked, mm -hmm. did you decide to just put them all on the same channel? So I have two shorts going on my main channel and yeah. I am trying to grow a, a shorts only channel. How's that going? Uh, it's slow, but why not? Why not? Who does the shorts? Same guy. The guy that does the thumbnails does the mm -hmm. shorts. Okay. So your, and then that's the whole thing. That's, it. that's thumbnails, titles, vidIQ, helping with optimization and millionaire interview conversations. Those are daily again, financial everybody, news. Everybody knows their time. And reverse engineer that over enough time, 10,000 uploads. Yeah. And now in the last year, and I think we talked about this, how much did you generate in ad revenue? Uh, over $80,000 just from AdSense. How many subscribers right now? Almost 50,000, 47,000, I think. And if you become a one rental at a time follower, <laughs> which I said, you're throwing a party at 50,000. I am, 50,000. I won't plan a minute of it until we hit 50,000. I, yeah. I don't like cashing checks early. Yeah, yeah 50,000, we're doing an event in Vegas. That's that's cool. I uh, am fully committed to being there. I'm excited for it. Okay, so um, that's all pumping out. And then what are the other income streams? So I wrote a book, One Rental at a Time, yes. which uh, is still a couple thousand dollars a month. And yeah. that was published, I think, 18. Power of a self-published book. Is it an audio too? It is now, and it's on Audible. Yeah. Okay, so you have the audio, ebook, and physical book. Correct. And when it's self-published, you make good margins. Seven bucks a book on Amazon. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And we'll, by the way, link everything up in the show notes. And and that would be, that's not going to really help you with content creation, but that's going to help you take your... It's it's the, the the idea is consistency. Yeah. Right? One rental at a time. But everything. it's going to teach you how to invest in real estate sure. practically. That's also one of the things I love about you. Get a lot of people out here just talking about multifamily stuff mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff, which is all, you know, whatever. Syndications right now are all getting squeezed. You're, what, I, what I love about you is it's the, anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. You're very conservative yes. and wise, and some people prescribe things that are a little sketchy that could put people, yeah. make them very vulnerable. Yeah, there's a lot of things in real estate because there's a lot of money and leverage and all of these things. I, I, I've been doing it 20 some odd years and seen people blow up. Right. And I don't want that for anyone. I, I really push the idea of if you just get to four. Doors. Four doors. Four, it could be four fourplexes, four, four houses, four whatever. Yeah. Uh, you're You're- financial future is bright. Yeah. You don't need 40. You don't need 400. You certainly don't need 4,000. And 4, you can 000. do it with a practical salary at yeah. your job, setting some money aside, being thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And and so, of course, there's videos on your channel about it, but there's the book. So we're talking about income streams. So you have ad revenue. And, and that was, as you said, three hours a day to do it all. Yep. To do the news. Do you count your research time? No, I would do that anyway. Because you do that anyway. And that's uh, a joy for you. So you yep. do that anyway. The time to do shoot for daily financial news, schedule with your guests, film with your guests, title, mm -hmm. schedule upload, oh, communicate if you need to with your thumbnail mm -hmm. shorts person, and then you check out. Yeah, done. What do you do the rest of the day? The rest of the day, they go home. Olivia and I will go have lunch. That's our thing. We're foodies. So yeah. we'll go someplace, eat lunch. Then I will exercise in the kind of early afternoon. Yeah. And then, you know, if a Warrior game's on, I'll watch that. If not, we'll, we'll go do something else. And you're also still actively, I mean, you you talk about the deals that you mm -hmm. do. So how oh, much time active. do you devote to... I'm probably spending an hour a day probably looking at deals, which really is the same hour I spent the last 20 And it's what you teach. It's what I teach. Look yeah. at your buy box. Buy box. Yeah, that's right. 20 minutes a day. Okay. So uh, to I've rabbit trailed our way away. So we're talking about ad revenue, the book, what else as far so as income So there's courses, streams. Yeah. again, which I never thought I would create one, but it's been wildly successful. I just, who I am, how to get started one rental at a time, seven steps on Teachable. Yeah. Again, why Teachable? Because it was easy for me. Again, it's it's video quality, not produced, not edited. None of that's even edited. It's just who I am. Yeah. And that was several hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And then and then you like recently threw an event. You put that up. And yeah. actually you give that away as part of your course. Yeah, it's in the course. It's in the bonus sections. Yeah. But also now it's a it's a feeder, right? Because I was seeing this just one course. Now I do events with a hundred people on Zoom. Again, I can save those files and give them out as for 40 bucks or whatever it is. So there's more content coming in other areas where people can like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not ready to spend four hundred. But I want to I want to try this, right? I did a deep dive on buy box, for example. Yeah, and so have you figured out that then? Um, are you uploading all these to the course area and whatnot, or are you also outsourcing some help in regards? To no, that? I do that. I upload those. Yeah. So what I'm hoping that comes across here is again, you figured out first. You retired, <laughs> got bored really quick. Yes. Wanted to make an impact. Wanted to make a difference. Thing one, which is so resonant, resonates with our ethos at mm -hmm. Think Media. Um, and you need money for the mission. So we're all, we're not uh, apologetic no. about 
pursuing the revenue, but it, but people that listen to this want to make a difference. They want to make an impact to people. You're doing that. You're getting all these messages, but it's also your model is, is different and it's sustainable. It's definitely not the only way other content niches, I would argue demand editing. Probably this one doesn't because it's so heavy education. Correct. Whereas, uh, you know, some of these cinema, if you were teaching cinematography and editing, Correct. you you know, like, cause like <laughs> if you're the, if you're kind of a Casey Neistat vlogger, well, that's, that is the storytelling. It's all this, but in terms of this, these, a lot of niches and even listeners to this, I think could really uh, benefit and it's practical. And then you've built it over years. You have a sustainable system, a nice rhythm. And then you also have, you do all the back end. Yep. You wrote the book. Yes. You you built out the course. Mm -hmm. You you can you can do all the things over time, and I hope that that's an encouragement to the listeners. I'm curious for someone saying, "Well, easy for you to say, you built all these connections." What is your advice for actually building? If someone's like, "Man, I want to start tapping into a strong network of people to have guests on the show," and all of how you've done that. Of all my guests, I only knew one of them previous starting. Yes. You just you just reach out to people cold. Okay. Right. I reached out to you cold. Yes. Right. And said, Hey, can we try this once? And yeah. I, and again, I've reached out to some people and, and they've, we've done one show and we will never do another one because yeah. I got that vibe. It's like, d doesn't click with one rental at a time. Yeah. But the ones that click and they come back, I asked them, right. And Anna Kelly was the first one to do it. Right. It's a, and a very different story, right. REI mom, she sold a big house in Texas, house act a fourplex in Pennsylvania. She lived upstairs. Just, just amazing stories. Just being a good person in, in networking in your area, it can come. Again, you could do, I really think one rental at a time and what I call the millionaires could work in any area. Find, other, like if you like classic cars, find other classic car folks and just talk. And if people love to hear competing views and we don't always agree. Totally. Right? And that's okay. We respect each other. We'll listen. And we'll also call each other out when we're wrong. There's just something in that of having two knowledgeable people who are go-givers riffing on a topic. It doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be sensationalized. People really, really appreciate that, I think. Yeah, that's super powerful. Um, so in just a second, I want to get into some questions even about how people can pre prepare for what may be coming even this year. Uh, get some of your perspective on how we can uh, be more intelligent financially as content creators and as entrepreneurs. Uh, I want to encourage, though, listeners, uh, if you want to check out any of Michael's resources, especially if you want to start earning extra money or exploring that with um, real estate, the book is a no brainer. The YouTube channel is a no brainer, but you can also check out his course and all that stuff in the description as well. But before we transition into a few other questions, what advice do you have for somebody that is in a similar season of life as you, the content creator that it, or as you were, and as you are now years into it with, with momentum and success and the network and the rhythm and a level of, I would say the confidence, the confidence is built because now it's here. It's, and it's all hindsight now, but the person who's looking at starting this, yeah. what are people going to think? What do I have unique to say to the conversation? You know, is it too late to start? <laughs> you know, should I start a YouTube show or a video podcast? or something like that, what advice would you have? I would tell someone in, you know, going back at 45, I probably should have started it earlier, but it's absolutely worth it. I actually think what you were gonna see, and I, I can see it because I'm in it every day, already transitioning. I think you can grow fast on YouTube being negative and clickbaity and all mm. of that. I think that's gonna have its time as AI sort of works its way to weed out that. People really are drawn to value and impact. So again, if you're 45 years old and you have a hobby or a passion that you spent time with, there is a show there. Mm. And oh, by the way, if it happens to be something you already love, it won't feel like work. I spend three hours a day on this and I'm excited for all of it. Yeah. It is just so much fun. So uh, I would tell you to just press play and go. And I would tell you to stop overthinking it. Yeah. It's literally, it's daily financial news. What I do is I take notes, usually I have a page of notes and I just tie it all together. Yeah. And then my millionaires, you're, you're absolutely right. We get on the phone, nothing's been prepped. I'm like, here's a couple of hot topics in in the news. And I ask, I always ask, do you have a topic? And we just go for 12 to 15 minutes. It's, it's a conversation. It doesn't have to be. And if it's something you love and you truly try to help, go find two or three other people. Go look in the Facebook groups, go yeah. to others. There's gotta be other yous out there. Yeah. So be the hub and just bring on other amazing people. That's powerful advice. And 
you know, I also want to just address the objection where, you know, someone might be saying, Sean, are you saying we shouldn't edit? Well, that's not what I'm prescribing at all. I think you need to find out your rhythm and your style. And while one rental at a time is not everybody's cup of tea. Of course. You're also not the only, you know, game in town, only show in town. But I think it proves how much diversity mm -hmm. and opportunity there is. There's a lot of different real estate voices, a lot of different, mm -hmm. at different levels. But when people hear the numbers and the growth, and I like to encourage people too, you're going to get that silver play button, but you're not even halfway at this exact moment and already crushing hmm. multiple six figures. And a lot of times we'll talk about that at Think Media where um, it, the the unknown creators, the non-famous creators, which become micro celebrities in your community, sure. like because people who know you, they hang out. They spend 365 days a year with you. Yes. There's people who like spend more time with you than like most of their family members in a way. Yeah. More consistent. For sure. But but like it's just so powerful to start and to then find a workflow that works for you. That's what I want people to be thoughtful. Like it, you, the workflow works for you. It's sustainable for you. It's the way you want to do it. Yeah. And it really resonates with your followers. I am one. I can also pick and choose. Daily yeah. Financial is my st staple. If I see any of the other topics that interest me, I can click on Correct. those. You know, and so very powerful, very inspiring. Um, switching gears a little bit, recession odds are at 70% and the U.S. faces stag a stagflation problem, mm -hmm. one report says. And of course, uh, but it could be, could be true. How should people prepare for a recession? Context here, you definitely have business owners. Sure. You have content creators, aspiring content creators. Your background in education is as an economist. Correct. And you're studying finances all the time. What are your predictions and how do you suggest we prepare? So first couple of thoughts. The chances of a recession are 100%. They are actually natural part of the business cycle. Yeah. And I'll even go this far. I hope you live through five of them, right? That just means you lived a full life. They're sure. that normal. Yes. So the chances of a recession are 100%. Now the argument is when. That's up for debate. I've actually on record saying I think it starts Q2, which is the, the, you know, the month that we're recording, right? It starts in April. Okay. We won't know that for nine months. I think the odds that it starts sometime this year are very high, probably in the 90s. There is a chance we have a soft landing, which I'll define as less than trend growth, call it sub 1%, but not negative. But inflation is high, and that's the dreaded stagflation. That is the 70s, right? It's just, ugh, right? Icky. But as an entrepreneur, which I think really makes this economy go, right, the small business owner, know that recessions are when you make moves. And it's not doesn't have to be money, but there'll be so many people out there nervous or cutting back or doing things. You can buy toys cheap, right? Whether that's a fancy camera or a per or whatever your thing is, there will be plenty of people trying to raise capital because they need cash to pay the bills because they were stimulus ballers when, you know, everybody's getting money. But recessions are when you make moves. It was ridiculously easy in my business of real estate to make money for two years, like 2020 and 2021. All the frauds came out. Anybody could do it, right? Sign a contract, sell the contract, make you a bunch of money. That's over. They're already going away. Mm. But if you focus on being a good operator, whatever your thing is, there will be less of you every quarter for the next eight quarters, and you will come out of this thing just a monster. This is my third Real big recession, that meaning the dot com and the Great Recession. I don't count the COVID recession, even though that was there was one there. It was such a V shaped recovery, not normal. But yeah, a recession typically is eighteen months on average. Uh, but then the good times are about eight to ten years. So we are in the bad time. You can argue when it starts, but it's it's around the corner. And so you're saying one of the ways to prepare and flourish during a recession is to be a good operator. You what what are be. a few of the distinctions that make a good operator? Whatever your thing is, it's no longer gambling. When when it's a hockey stick, you take you take chances with money. Oh, I've never done direct mail. Again, I'm speaking to my business. I'm going to give it a shot. It's only a grand. Who cares? Well, that's not going to fly and in, in you're not going to take that shot. You're going to keep that money in dry powder and, and do something else with it. It's smart moves. It's moves mm. that you know there's a return on. It's not hiding, it's being more focused in, in, in doing that. In entrepreneurship, some people say you got to play offense. Some people say you can't, you know, a good defense wins games. Which are you, offense or defense? Well, I've again, I believe in a recession, you have to prepare for it. So if you follow my channel, you know that I told people six months ago, time to get ready. What does that mean to me? I mean, take all my debt that was variable and get it fixed, right? I had apartment buildings 
a fixed of 3.99%. Now people are losing apartments because rates are in the sevens, right? So you you when you see them coming, you can make moves to prepare. Yeah. But now I've done that. I've cleaned up my balance sheet. I've cleaned up my income statement. Now it's like, let's go find some deals because there'll be less people with cash that can write checks. There'll be less people that are creative. And oh, by the way, I'm in Vegas because I needed to skill up. I've identified two areas in my business where I don't have depth of experience. One is large apartment buildings. I don't know that we'll do one, but I'm willing to listen and learn and go get around that room. Be the small fish in a different room. Mm. And the other one's creative financing. I've done seller financing, but not sub two and other things. So I will investigate other areas that are like tools missing on my tool belt in this time. So again, invest in yourself, find out what you may need and go after it. What advice would you give to the non-real estate investor to prepare for recession. So the first thing I would do is look at look at your past 90 days of spending, right? This is this the good news about this you only do this once. Where did my money go? The big thing for me is what's a need versus a want. We're not doing any wants right now. We're only doing needs. Yeah. Okay? That's the big thing and it's uncomfortable. And if you have the fortitude to do it, I would I would share with somebody the the results of that. Mm. Because what you may think is a need so process it with others that you to trust. get some really unbiased yes. feedback or somebody that will speak some truth and love to you. Yes. Because any cash that you can save now on a monthly basis will be dry powder for those things because there will be a, amazing opportunities to make moves, but you got to get ready for that. There was an article that on Mashable that asked the question, is the creator economy really recession proof? What do you think about when you think about content creators, video podcasters, entrepreneurs creating content? Do you think it's recession proof? I think if you're a good operator, it absolutely is recession proof. What I do and what we've talked about earlier, scheduled process plan, keep going, people can rely on it. You don't get sketchy, you don't, you know, you don't change mid-flight and do something else and drop this and drop that. Absolutely. But that said, there will be a lot of people in the game that aren't in the game in the year because they're not consistent. They're 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 not focused in my opinion. And so part of one of the things I'm hearing you say just to clarify, a good operator has a lot to do with good financial stewardship. Yeah, you because when you don't have that, that pressure is real. Yeah. It makes you it can make you make poor decisions just to alleviate pain. So you must prepare. I strongly suggest prepare for it. Yeah. So you can make moves with confidence. And keeping I mean, what what is one of your quotes that you say? You say uh, get to get close to revenue. Yes, get close to revenue. Absolutely. What does that mean? So one of the things that that um, in a good economy right? Like that was taking off. There's all these special projects. And yeah, you've heard all the tech companies. We hired a bunch of people. It was an arms race. They didn't know what they would do, but they were talented. So we hired them. They're now being let go. Yeah. Right. So what I strongly suggest is the closer that you can get in its core revenue, the more likely you are not to What's get What's core revenue? So again, like let's talk about whether it be Google or, you know, any of these companies, they have these special projects. Like that's the future of the company. Mm -hmm. Then- your, your accountant going into a recession going, I need to whack 8%. What's that group over there? There's no revenue, but wow, look at that headcount. You're seeing a lot of that happen. And, and let's be clear, that's not, in, in the Silicon Valley, what I shared a year ago was not popular. I had a bunch of engineers and computer scientists telling me, you're crazy, I'm the future of the company. I know we don't sell anything, but you just wait. Now they're coming back to me going, you were right, I got laid off. I'm wow. like, and told so, so for So for the non-tech worker or non-CEO of a company, mm -hmm. get get close to revenue would mean cut unnecessary expenses. Yeah, don't take flyers now. This is not the time to try something left field, Yeah, right? What I would tell you to do, whether you're a content creator, is stay core, right? For me, everything's one rental at a time. I'm not gonna become a gold show yeah. or something else. And we, yeah, we say find the shortest path to revenue. It's like find the simplest business plan, find something solid, work it, Keep expenses low. Mm -hmm. Don't spend your money on dumb stuff. Spend your money on content creation for what it costs, mm -hmm. which could mean I always encourage people too. That could mean a plane ticket. It could be it could it, it, like something. It could mean to collaborate. You don't need my, gear. Doesn't have to be that expensive. But those types of investments. The, sometimes we can become techaholics a little bit. We're buying unnecessary <laughs> stuff. But if but you want the essentials. Sure. If it supports your core business. Well, you're saying cut the felonious expenditures and stay on the things that actually move the needle and get close to revenue. Watch your PL type. Yeah, why watch the PL? Again, know what brings, you know, whatever that is for you, you know, dollars in the door. Do more of that. 
get better at that. There will be a time to expand. There will be a time to try new things. It's not in a recession. At the time of recording this, May 1st, we there's a, a bunch of people are announcing their presidential runs. Biden announced that he's running. Trump has announced that he's running. How much do you think this timing with a, an election here in the U.S. in 2024 is going to affect the economy? Well, it always does. I mean, if you go back and study history, president uh, the year before a presidential election, I mean, certainly if you look at the stock market charts, they're always usually up and to the right, meaning later in the year they get better. It's going to be the topic. It, it will be the economy, in yeah. my opinion. The, the election will come down to the economy. Do you think that uh, the current state of the economy is truly the current presidential uh Joe Biden and the Democratic Party's fault, or do you think they inherited a lot of it? Uh, I think both parties sort of got into it. This started, right, the, 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 the kindling that became what we are suffering now was started before that. Yeah. Right? A lot of this came down because we chose to shut the economy down. And totally. You chose, you, you choose, once you chose that- Yeah. It was a domino effect uh, and then printed zillions eight of dollars. Trillions or whatever the heck the number is. <laughs> we're we're going to be sucking that out. I mean, M2 money supply, which, you know, is this fancy thing about how it's being, it's gone negative since first time since 1933. And if you want to go out and see what happened in 1933, it's called the Great Depression. Yeah. Right. We've just done that. Wow. So pretty crazy stuff going on. So do you think, uh, you know, hot takes on the podcast sure. that that really the Democratic Party has a chance because at the end of the day, when you count voting, a lot of times it comes down to economy. There is yeah. a lot of issues and there's a lot of hot button issues. Mm -hmm. But when people are experiencing pain financially Correct. and I they don't want to blame a, somebody, they want to blame somebody. And so do you think it, it flips in this election? Well, again, I think so. Let me let me play this out. So it's 2023, May 1st. I believe we're going to be in a recession. Let's call it for 12 months. Yeah. He might get lucky because people are going to remember the last six months. So you mean it might start kind of turning around, right? You may. And we, if there's an upswing right right into, before, got which it. is hard to it's hard to time, right? You're not going to remember last year when you were unemployed. Yeah. You're going to be happy. Oh, I got a job now. Yeah. So it's not so much the bad economy, which I think gets worse for the rest of the year, but there is a chance that this looks better next summer and the elections in November. Hmm. He might get lucky. I'm not calling that. I think this might be two years, but I could, I could tell you it might 12 months, right? So he might get lucky on timing, but yeah, it'll be about the economy, I think. So uh, as we land the plane, what are some of just your final, as an operator yourself, a lot of our community, one, can learn from you because you've been there, you've done that, you've had a lot of lessons. A, a lot of others, this conversation is actually stepping outside of what we normally would talk about. And some people are like, dude, I'm just trying to start a YouTube channel. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to get a side income going. Yeah. I'm trying to, you know, get out of my day job. Sure. I'm trying to I'm trying to go part time. I'm trying to quit. I'm trying to figure this thing out. What What are maybe some of the habits or the traits that you think are essential disciplines, routines for someone to, you know, eventually be able to quit their day job and ultimately lean into their dream job, which for 99% of our listeners sure. is to, is to create what you have done. And that is a, a YouTube channel, a media company, a solo ran yeah. with a few people helping YouTube channel that pays the bills and that yeah. gives freedom and allows to give you a platform and a, and a voice. What are some of the habits, disciplines, things people should study, lifestyle, the way people should be, you know, yeah. uh, if they're wanting to get into this? I think most people overcomplicate it. Mm. Right. If you're coming to this, you're coming to think media, you have something you're passionate about. It could have been a lifetime hobby. I mean, it could be anything, it could be Star Wars, it could be whatever that is. Yeah. All it, my model, find your thing around that. Make that your show. For me, that's the daily financial news. And then go find four or five other amazing folks who are willing to give you one hour a week, but don't want to have their own channel, but they like giving, they like discussing. It, it builds itself. Right, you have to be consistent. I would tell if you're going to start, you can't do less than 100 videos. Right, I think too many people before do. judging it. Yeah, before you're not going to find out your rhythm, your talk, and nobody watches the first hundred anyway. So it's like the first pancake; it doesn't really look like anything. Yeah. Right. So just, just, just go for it. Yeah, I love it. Well, Michael Zuber, really appreciate you. For those people that want to connect with you, follow you. Uh, where are you at? Of course, we'll link everything up in the show notes. One rental at a time, everywhere.